Okay, hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, welcome to Obvious. Um, I'm Padmini, uh, I'm head of communications here. Uh, we just wanted to uh, tell you that there are just a few housekeeping rules to observe. Uh, the bathrooms are to your left. Um, and there's coffee and tea and water. Please help yourself during the course of the conversation. Uh, we have a code of conduct that will be enforced during the event in case you want to take a look at it. Uh, it's on our playbook, which is available at the link um, on top. Uh, if you need anything, uh, do just come and talk to me. Otherwise, enjoy the event. Um, and I think we're going to focus, Gotham's going to talk maybe a little less than he <laughs> anticipated he will, he will because we think that we uh, need more time for discussion and questions and answers. So that's probably going to be the that we're going to yeah. So yeah, I'll just hand over to Kiran, who is from Hasbro, hosting this event. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm actually hosting this event on behalf of the community. We are a group of people from technical and legal backgrounds who have been working on decoding how technology intersects with the law. And Gautam's been part of the group for a couple of years now at least. Yeah. And uh, Gautam's been a huge source of understanding of how to interpret the law for all those of us coming from a technical background. And so that's something I want to understand audience. How many of you are from a technical background? Okay. And how many from a legal background? Okay. And how from other backgrounds? So there's design, there's marketing in the back over there. Uh, I'm sure there's a huge diversity of it. Yeah, music. Okay. So part of what we're going through in our modern society is used to think of the law as being somewhat moot while we went about our day-to-day -day lives. And the law was just something to be afraid of because you would get caught crossing the road when you're not supposed to cross and then you pay a fine or something trivial like that. And over the last few years, at least for us in the tech community, Realize that our work intersects of a lot more than we are comfortable with, and a lot more that we have awareness of, and therefore the software that we write has consequences for human rights that we do not see coming, and we do not know how to think about at all. So part of what uh, the current community has been trying to do over the last couple of years is bring that awareness into mainstream society. And obviously, we don't do this by saying, uh, here is something to read, but we try to do this by saying, go where people are already reading, which is mainstream publication. So if a journalist is writing about software problems and how they're affecting citizens, we try to help them understand what is the software in the first place and how is it affecting people in ways that may not yet be manifesting as problems. So that's, that's one side of it. And Gautam, obviously, uh, a constitutional scholar has been helping us understand how to think about the law in the first place. And the books, I think, are fantastic reading. This is his second book. Uh, he's got another one on free speech. Uh, both of them are really worth reading. I think Gautam is an incredibly good writer. He also has a blog on Indian constitutional law and philosophy. Uh, it's a blog that is both extremely readable and is also well read in that you will find Supreme Court justices reading the blog to understand how their own bits are making sense outside of their own courts. Okay. So, Gautam, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, first of all, thank you to Hasgeek for inviting me and thank you to Obvious for this, this beautiful space. It's, it's, it feels very nice to, to be here. I should begin by also clarifying how I come to, to this whole issue. Um, and so, around 2015-16, I was approached to help out with the Aadhaar litigation the constitutional challenge to Aadhaar that was uh, then pending in the Supreme Court. And over the next three years, I was, I was heavily involved in, in research, uh, in, in some drafting, in briefing lawyers to argue the case and so on. And that was when I began to understand the uh, interface between technology and, uh, and the law, and more specifically the constitution and, uh, and human rights. So, so that's how I came to, to all of this. And I should also therefore clarify that that I am a lawyer and, and my background is, is legal. I'm not a technologist and so obviously uh, my expertise is, is not in that domain. And so I think what at least what I will try to, to put across through the course of this discussion is to, um, is to maybe bring to light some of the constitutional principles that I found coming up again and again in cases like Aadhaar and in other similar cases and how I as a lawyer found the interface between technology and, and human rights to be. And perhaps that might give some of you ideas about uh, how these principles, these values 
might be relevant in, in your work and we could of course take that forward uh, in the discussion. So I want to begin with a small anecdote that um, I came across re very recently although the broader context of that is, is something I've been reading about for a while now. And this uh, story begins in, in Chile in 1968. Um, Chile 1968 is, is when uh, a man called Salvador Allende, who used to be a doctor working in rural areas, bringing medical services to poor people, uh, finds himself the president of, of Chile uh, at the head of the Socialist Party and, and he's, he's won the election. And uh, this is the second attempt, he lost the first time, the second time he is successful. And one of Allende's first, uh, you know, real goals is to mitigate the severe imbalance in the control of resources in Chile. Because over the course of history, uh, a few private players had basically captured ownership over most of, of the important natural resources um, in, in Chile. So Allende begins with nationalizing some of the important uh, natural resources. But unlike the top-down socialist model that you know, we've come to associate with nationalization, he doesn't stop there and he doesn't think that that is what this uh, project is about. Because what he's really keen to do and, and, to, and to bring, based on his experiences working as a doctor in rural areas, is to bring a genuine democratic participation in decisions about how resources are to be used, uh, how you know, factories should work. And, uh, and so his idea of management is decentralized and it envisions people uh, having significant decision-making control over these kinds of activities, what we now know as the idea of industrial democracy. So, to, and, and the other unique thing about Ayande is that he is very, very curious about technology. And so he combines these two interests and he wants to use technology to implement his idea of a certain democratic decentralization of management and control. To do that, Ayande's advisors approach an eccentric Englishman called Stafford Beer, who has been engaged in uh, all kinds of ideas and, and writing about uh, how tech can be used in management and a theory called informational cybernetics that he pioneers in, in many books. Uh, and so they approach Stafford Beer and Stafford Beer flies to Chile to, uh, to advise Ayande on how to develop this idea. And that becomes something called Project CyberSyn. And that is uh, the, uh, a photograph of the control room of Project CyberSyn back, and this is, uh, this, this is built in 1970. So much before uh, the real explosion of, of tech and its you know, uh, omnipresence. So they built Project CyberSyn and the way it's supposed to work is that you have a number of telex machines uh, that connect individual factories to this uh, control room. And you have inputs coming in from these factories that are on a regular basis about production uh, data, figures, what's happening there. And then these are fed into uh, economic models that, that give you information about what that means. And then decision makers sitting here have access to all these screens and then they can take calls on whether something is, is, is uh, you know, going well or going badly and, and so on. Uh, an interesting application of this was when, um, when um, so Allende is, is, is severely disliked by, by the outgoing establishment. And so to attempt to bring down his government, they organize a strike of, of truck drivers to attempt to prevent uh, resources from being transported across the country and therefore create a shortage. Uh, so Allende and his advisors use Project Cybersyn to understand where to bring the resources to at what times. And with the help of small a small number of trucks, uh, 200 trucks, they're able to break the 40,000 uh, trucks that are part of the strike by strategically going to where uh, resources are most needed. So that's one application this is put to. Now, uh, the ending is not a happy one. So Allende is overthrown in a military coup in 1973 and uh, General Pinochet takes power. And the first thing he does is to destroy Project Cybersyn. Uh, so that it, it ends with, without it ever actually being um, taken forward and genuinely becoming a model or a project. And Stafford Beer then also has to flee and he has survivor's guilt for the rest of his life and, and, uh, and doesn't really do anything after that. That's how the story ends. But the really interesting anecdote I want to you know, put out, uh, could we have the next uh, uh, photo please? 
Is that yeah? So when when this is a photograph uh, illustration from Stafford Beer's book, where he's where he's basically connecting how the firm works and how the human body works, and and he's selling the project to INDA using these diagrams, and so he's basically comparing the the control room that you saw uh, a few minutes ago to the brain uh, and how the brain directs um, you know the intelligence inputs of the body and, and directs various movements in the body. And so he's, he's selling it to Ayanda using this, this illustration. And, and he's about to say that, look, this is how it's all going to work. And, uh, and that brain there in, in that illustration, that's you. That's what he's going to, to tell him. Before he can say that, Ayanda leans back in his chair, smiles, looks at the brain and says, that's the people. And, and that for Stafford Beer is, is a, a moment of conversion where a number of assumptions that he had held all his life about management, about control, about how the firm should work in one line, in one sentence, in one illustration are completely overturned. And later in life when he's being interviewed about this project, he recalls that moment as being one of the most important moments of his life where he understood exactly what INDS project was about. And, and this whole idea of, of if you think of, of the brain as being one person in control, uh, the tech that you're going to then use will be utilized in certain ways, certain assumptions. If you think of the brain as not being the president or the leader, but being the democracy, or the demos, the people, you think of it very differently and its use becomes very different. And in these small illustrations and in these small words, the entire idea changes. So that's the, that's the anecdote I think that, that at least has stuck with me since I came across it um, a few days ago and it, it, for me it helped to clarify what was so unique and different about uh, the project and if you're of course interested there are a lot of articles and, and you know, a lot of scholarship on, uh, on what this whole thing was about and, and where it might have gone had it not been uh, terminated early by a military coup. Uh, and that's kind of the framework within which I want to um, uh, have this discussion that, that um, that we often think of, of tech as being as being something neutral, external to the world, and its effects as being divorced from it. But often the effects come in the design itself and in the ideas that animate why we are doing what we are doing. Um, so I want to I want to start by 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 the two quotes that that I've I've come across. Um, I came across during the course of research for for my book, the last chapter of which deals with some of these ideas. Uh, the the first quote I came across was in a piece in Factor Daily, an interview with the CEO of a company called Face Tiger. I don't know if that company is still around and, and if it's, if it's, you know, uh, if, it, if, it, if it's going. So the CEO was talking about the uses of Face Tiger and, and he says, and I'll quote, um, imagine a guy walking on the road at 2 a.m. who is looking suspicious. Uh, police patrol can take the suspect's photograph with our app and within a second receive details of his crime history. Uh, this was in the context of the Chennai police using the app in a, in a marketplace before a festival was going to happen. And the CEO obviously thought that this was a very useful uh, thing to check crime and to ensure law and order in the streets and so on. That's the first quote and I'll, I'll come back to that. The second quote is something that Shyam Devan, the leading lawyer for the petitioners in the Aadhaar case, uh, said during the course of oral arguments in court. Um, I was a few feet from him and I heard him say it and it was quite a, a powerful moment. So when talking about Aadhaar and how Aadhaar resets the relationship between the individual and the state, uh, Shyam Dewan said that the constitution is not a charter of servitude. Those were his lines. And, uh, and, I'd, and I'd, I'd like to, at the end of this discussion, draw the link between these two quotes, which may not immediately seem obvious, but I think that there is a, a fundamental and important link. But I'll begin by, by unpacking what Shyam Dewan said in a little more detail. So when he said that the, the constitution is not a charter of servitude, what he meant was that the constitution as an idea, as a document, as a vision is fundamentally about power. It, it talks about the existing relations of, of power that exist in society and it provides various pathways, various signposts, various methods to alter some of those relations of power. That comes across in various specific provisions which we could talk about. It comes across most vividly in the three words that you find in the preamble which is now becoming quite popular. It's been read out you know, in various protest gatherings. 
the three words that originally come from the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. In, in a very basic way, the idea of liberty is to increase freedom by constraining state power. The state, as we have found out in vivid terms recently, is a very, very powerful institution and it can do a lot to all of us. So the idea of liberty as enshrined in various constitutional provisions like the freedom of speech, the right to life, the right to personal liberty, the right to conscience and so on, seeks to create a zone of freedom by putting limitations on the kinds of power the state can exercise upon you and in the ways in which it can do so and when it can't do so. The second idea of course is equality and equality is also about power. So if you think about the long-lasting debate about reservations, good, bad, should we have them, should we not have them, it is fundamentally a question about how over the last few centuries, relations of power have put certain kinds of barriers between people and access to very basic goods like education, public posts and so on. And the vision of substantive equality that the constitution subscribes to attempts to break those kinds of power relations by ensuring that that access is now uh, provided through even proactive and affirmative means like for example reservations and, and other ideas that, that we could talk about. And the third idea is fraternity uh, in very basic terms the relations between individuals without the state playing any part and that idea comes from a unique Indian history where the state despite being very powerful was never the only or the sole center of power. There were always social institutions, uh, cultural institutions that exercised as great and as severe a kind of, of domination and power over individuals. Caste, of course, is, is the most vivid example of that. And uh, it's interesting that Ambedkar, one of the, the chief drafting people of the constitution, one of his foremost political movements was for access to water from village drinking wells because Dalits weren't allowed to, to use the same well as, as upper caste were. And Ambedkar framed this, this movement as about being the right to access public space. Uh, and that found its view, way into the constitution through uh, provisions like Article 15, Clause 2 that prohibits discrimination between private persons in access to shops, hotels, restaurants, other public spaces on grounds of caste, gender and so on. So you have these, these three ideas, liberty, equality and fraternity, each of which are concerned with the different kinds of power relations that exist in society. And the idea of the constitution is to interrogate them, to undermine them and to, to create a new kind of equation where democracy, which is the equalization of, of these relations, comes not just in the equation between the individual and the state, but also in private relations involving private persons because the kinds of power that operate there are as serious as exist when the state is involved. So, and so for many years after the constitution, this entire idea of, of power revolved around access to physical spaces, to physical goods, uh, reservations being the one example, surveillance of a very basic kind, watching your house and so on, that, that was often an issue. Uh, sedition, all these ideas, they were about, they were set in, in, in the actual physical world. Now, over the last few years, what's happened is that the introduction of, of tech into this space, uh, and therefore the, the connection between, between tech and the constitution is that tech intervenes into these relations of power, and it could actually entrench some of them, perpetuate some of them, but also continue with the constitutional vision of undermining them, of, of, of democratizing them. So to understand how, let's come back to the face tiger quote, right? So just to reread the quote, imagine a guy walking on the road at 2 a.m. who is looking suspicious. A police patrol can take the suspect's photograph with our app and within a second receive details of his crime history. Now I want to, I want to focus on four, four phrases here. The first is the phrase looking suspicious. If you think about it, you think about 2 a.m. at night walking down the street. Who is it that looks suspicious and to whom? In this case, obviously, this interview is given to a factor daily. The people who read it are people like you and me. So, uh, who is it to us who looks suspicious? Now, if it's one of us, dressed like one of us, walking down, say, Church Street after a late night, that person wouldn't look suspicious to us. Uh, they would look you know, what we think of as, as normal. 
and so they would to the police as well, also the addressees of, 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 this, of this interview. The people who look suspicious are people who don't look like us normally, who are not dressed like us, whom we think as, as perhaps being from a socioeconomic background that is not as, as elite as us, and we think of them as, as perhaps being on their way to commit a crime or, or there for purposes that, that are, are not particularly healthy or good. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, rec I'm recalling this incident just from yesterday that there was a, that sting that, that uh, India Today did about um, those attacks in JNU. And one of the people whom they interviewed said that, that he was, you know, going with his stick and he saw a person with a beard who looked Kashmiri and so he went and beat him up. Right? So you can see how uh, the very term looking suspicious is not a neutral term. It's all about who is doing the looking, the watching and what looks suspicious to them and what they're in a position to do about that. And in this case, obviously, it's the police who will, if they think someone looks suspicious, can take that photograph and upload that into the database. Right? So that's, that's one thing. Second is the police patrol. Now, on, in which neighborhoods do you find police patrols? Where does the police go and, and patrol? These are, these are questions of political geography. And if you do a study in any big city, you'll find that, that certain neighborhoods and certain areas receive far greater police scrutiny than uh, others do. And, and these are along the lines of income, uh, along the lines of class, and often along the lines of religion. Uh, Srinivas Kodli, who I'm sure you all know, is not here right now, has done a lot of research in Hyderabad and shown how in Muslim neighborhoods, police have these cordon searches where they just randomly go in uh, and ask people to give their Aadhaar details. So the moment you mention the word police patrol, you automatically make certain assumptions of where the police is going to be and, and in those neighborhoods are the police thought of as protectors, as people who are meant to keep you safe or are they thought of as invaders who are meant to cause you trouble. That changes depending on which neighborhood you are in. Uh, look at the US, there is a lot of research on, on, on how, in, how you have what they call stop and search where the police can stop you and search you if they think that in your car you might be carrying heroin or drugs and there is a clear link between a black driver being stopped and searched, which happens far more than a white driver. So that also happens. The third, of course, is the suspect's photograph. Right? Uh, and when does the police feel entitled to just take a photograph of an individual without their consent and upload that? Presumably, again, in, in Church Street, if you're walking down the street, they would be a little more hesitant before just taking a photograph and uploading that. A kind of hesitation that may not be that apparent in other neighborhoods. And of course, the last is crime history. And uh, if you look at the statistics, and we'll come back to this uh, later on, you will find that the prison population in India has a disproportionate representation of Dalits and Muslims. So the relevant correlation between the population uh, that, that the, the Indian population has of Dalits and Muslims, vis-a-vis -vis the number of them in prison is, is, is very, very disproportionate. There's a far greater number of them in prison than uh, than actually uh, in the population, and and of course, a uh, simple answer to that is that that it could be it could be because they commit more crimes. But if you go a little deeper, you will find that that a lot of biases operate in the criminal justice system that uh, that 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 are, are that result in this kind of a ratio. You see it a lot in the recent uh, protests in in UP, where uh, the police themselves have admitted now that they have, uh, they have taken a whole bunch of people from Muslim neighborhoods that weren't involved in protests, so they just pick them up randomly. And, and these kinds of figures then inflate the, the, the prison population of, of these communities. So the moment you are uploading some of that photograph and checking against the crime history, you should know that the data that already came in and made the crime history itself is not free from all kinds of biases. And so you see how this seemingly straightforward statement of taking a photograph and uploading it into a crime history at 2 in the night on a road where somebody is walking and looking suspicious carries within it implicitly a whole host of assumptions, biases that can perpetuate already existing uh, kinds of marginalization and vulnerabilities that exist in society along various fault lines. And, and but once you have this app that does this, it's out of your control, right? The police will use it and they will use it in the ways that they deem fit. And so in the very design of, of, of the app, you have given the possibility of these kinds of, of uses. 
which will then be magnified in the actual use. And uh, if you want more examples of this, very vivid and concrete examples, there's a great book called Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, and she takes the examples in the US of the housing market, for, for instance, of the decision of, of custody of children, and so on. And, and she shows how it's not that tech is itself creating problems, but you have, if, you have, if you have existing fault lines in society, then the use of tech can magnify those fault lines or it can mitigate them. And that's where the, the key question arises. Now, I want to link back briefly the example, this is the statement uh, that the CEO of Face Tiger made with the constitution because I've talked about the problems, the problems that it, it creates. But what does the constitution have to say about it? And let's begin with the idea of equality because that's really at the heart of a lot of the debates around the interface between, between tech and the constitution. Now, for a long time, we used to operate with a very narrow understanding of equality. The idea was that unequal treatment can only take place if there is an agent, a specific individual, who is doing that unequal treatment. And that agent has to be guided by malice, by bad motives, by, by bad reasons. So right, okay, if a, if a cop, if a policeman deliberately and, and intentionally stops a person on the street because, because they are black right, and searches them, that's discrimination, that's unequal treatment. But for that, you have to have a specific person, the, the, the policeman doing that, and you have to show that the reason why he did that was because he's a racist, he doesn't like black people, because he's motivated by, by you know, ill intent towards that race. That was, a, that was the definition of equality uh, in our understanding what unequal treatment means. Of course, a very narrow understanding. Over the last couple of decades in, in, in the Indian constitutional context over the last uh, few years, in cases like the 377 case, which you all know about, uh, and, and, and the privacy judgment, which also I'm sure you all know about, there's been a much more nuanced and evolved understanding of, uh, of what equality means. And this is an understanding that no longer looks at inequality as being the, 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 the result of individual choices to discriminate individual malicious motives, individual racism, but as a, as a, as a function of design, uh, of design that goes into how our institutions operate and how our social structures operate. So this kind of, of an approach looks at not the reasons un, or the motivations underlying actions, but at the results or the effects of those actions. So if you find, for example, that in a workplace, the proportion of, of men to women far outnumbers the proportion in the larger population, that should give you an indication that something is wrong. You may after, after detailed research find that the reasons underlying that have nothing to do with gender disparity, but more often than not you will find that actually they do. So for instance, if a, a particular workplace does not have a pregnancy leave policy in place, then it will discourage a number of women from applying for the job in the first place. And then that will result in a skewed workforce. This is a very basic and simple example. But of course, inequality can have many more nuances that are not as, as basic as this. So this understanding of inequality takes into account, first of all, a long history where there was a prior history of intentional discrimination, which is now being done away with, but whose effects still persist. The philosopher Bernard Williams had a very interesting example where he talked about how uh, imagine a society in which only a certain class of people can become uh, soldiers. Right? A, of informally in law, you have that discrimination written into the, into the law. Now, at some point you remove that and so now formally it's all equal. Anyone can apply for the army. But you also find that over the years, because the army is, is revered in the society, those who were, who were in the army, people of a certain class, had access to the best kind of, of healthcare, the best kind of access to, to the most nutritious diets, all of that. And so now you have a seemingly formally equal test, but you also find that only those people who are already in the army are now in the position to make use of the neutral criteria you have put in place, say a physical test and so on. And so obviously you have to go beyond just neutrality and ask yourselves, what is the underlying uh, reason for 
the effect being unequal. So look at look at the historical reasons. Look at how institutions work, unquestioned norms, unquestioned biases, and look at the effects. And then in that sense, you get a much a much broader idea of what equality means and requires. And so when you come back to to the face tiger example, what you find is that under the old and, and narrow view of, of inequality, you wouldn't find some, anything wrong with this. But because, okay, you have built this, this app. The point of the app is actually to ensure law and order. So the police will use it to try and, and check suspicious people moving around. And so there's nothing in the app itself that, that, that is biased. But, okay, maybe the odd policeman, you know, has a prejudice against Muslims or against, you know, people of a certain class. But you can always deal with that by training him or, or giving him or her, you know, test, uh, uh, you know, lessons. Whereas this broader idea of equality goes much beyond that and looks at the systemic uh, presumptions and biases that underlie the police force, the criminal justice system, and asks how that links to what the app is doing. And so, and so of course, if you ask those questions at the beginning, when you're thinking about what this app will do, what your goals are, what your purposes are, then you may end up designing something different. What you would do, obviously I can't tell because that's not my area of expertise. But if those ideas are in your mind when you're when you starting off, as opposed to at the end of the process, then you may find that the design is something else that, that um, takes into account all these, all these variables. You're still talking about, in the police example, you're still talking about you know, a, a more conscious bias in the police force. But it might be even more you know, subtle and even more nuanced. So one thing that's on the radar right now is the DNA bill, which talks about DNA data banks uh, and you know having uh, a data bank of, of criminal suspects. So what this uh, data, this proposed law does, for example, is that it, it says that if you're convicted of, of an offense, then your data will be stored permanently in in uh, in the in the data server and uh, in the DNA data bank. And if you're the trial going on, then there's something more. But even if you're a suspect of a crime, still the police can take your DNA and, and put it in the in the data bank. Now again, coming back to the whole idea of how the how the criminal justice system substantially overrepresents certain sections of the population in the in prison, even as under trials without being convicted, you will then find by extension that the data bank will uh, will then have a disproportionate uh, uh, number of of people belonging to those communities whose privacy will be violated, uh, who will be subject to the possibility of false matches in the data bank and so on. So in the US they actually found that, that because the DNA data banks uh, disproportionately had the DNA of certain communities, the risks of false positives and therefore of false convictions exponentially arose for those communities. And so again you may think you're working on a DNA data bank, but if you see the chain of, of causation, you will find that, that it, it leads to consequences that you wouldn't even imagine when you're working on the bank itself because those aren't necessarily in your mind because what you're working on is just making that data bank as good as it can be. And so I think that, that um, at the very beginning of the process, thinking about these constitutional values and principles and how they would impact the project at all its stages. Uh, would, would go a long way towards um, thinking about, about issues of design. Often these would require having difficult conversations with people that, uh, that, that are not always immediately within your immediate you know, context. So I remember that um, at the whole time of the Aadhaar debate, uh, there's a person called Bezwara Wilson, some of you might know him. Uh, he runs this organization called the Safai Karamchari Andolan. Uh, and, his, and for the last 30 years, he has been involved in the fight against manual scavenging. So as you know, in, in throughout India, we still have this practice, technically outlawed, um, but it's still very much there. And he has been fighting for the rights of, uh, of, of people who are forced into manual scavenging for many years. Now, he was one of the strongest uh, opponents of Aadhaar. And his reasons were some were reasons that, that I, coming from a very different background, couldn't understand fully back then and I still don't understand completely myself. So he said, and he wrote an article and it's, it's online and you can read it. So he said, he was talking about how uh, certain schemes that were specifically targeted at, uh, at the community of manual scavengers uh, required mandatory 
uh, production of Aadhaar in order to avail of, of those benefits. Um, and he said that, that this whole process is, is essentially fixing us in a particular identity as manual scavengers. And all our lives we have been trying to escape that, to move beyond that. And now this mandatory uh, production of, of Aadhaar to get those schemes essentially locks us into that identity, uh, makes us, you know, uh, uh, thinks of us as being fixed there in, in, in that position. And we want to, you know, go out of that. So we don't want this whole idea of, of one nation wide entry that the government is pushing. We, we don't want that because our identity for us is, a, a source, is not a source of pride. And we are trying to leave that behind and you aren't letting us do that. Uh, and I couldn't understand it back then fully and I, as I said, I still can't quite figure out what that means in concrete terms. Uh, maybe if I spoke more with him and, and listened more to him, I could understand more where he's coming from. But clearly you're talking about a person here who's, who's really been in that field for, for many, many years and who has an objection to uh, this, this particular piece of, of tech that is, is, requires a, a lot of listening and understanding to even grasp for those of us who have never been in that position. Much more basic issue, of course, was that uh, a person who is homeless, doesn't have a permanent address, had particular problems in, in getting an Aadhaar. Now, if at the time of, of, of designing it, at the time of, of asking those questions, um, people who have never had to deal with what homelessness means, and there's no reason why you should be thinking about those issues, but there are real issues that then come up after it's all done and it's too late to, and then all you have are fi little fixes here and there, which actually again shows you that, that um, the issues of, of constitutional design are really important at all stages of thinking about these projects. And I think, again, Eubanks has the best statement on this and I'll, I'll, I'll just quote um, from there. She says that when automated decision making tools are not built to dismantle structural inequalities, their speed and scale intensifies them. And I'm just thinking back about something that Nilekani said way back, move fast and break things. Um, ultimately, you're not just breaking things, you're breaking people as well. And that's something I think which is very important to remember because the point Eubanks is making is that what tech brings is speed and scale. And if, if you have those fault lines which I've talked about, the speed and the scale then tends to intensify them unless you're thinking about how to actually undermine them and, and mitigate them. So what is, you know, to be done and I'll, I'll close with that, uh, with just an idea. Uh, in, in some countries and now in, in some, among some scholars, they have developed what they call technological self-determination. It's a, it's a big series of words, but basically the idea is that, that at all points of time, uh, individuals should have the right to decide for themselves how they will engage with a particular technological system or a piece of technology. They should, be, they should have the power and the ability to decide on what terms they will bring that tech into their lives and on, on what terms they will engage with it and they may choose not to engage at all and that's fine. If they don't have to, to engage with it. Uh, because again, I, I'm coming back to again something else that Nilekani said, he said once that, that um, uh, if you don't have Aadhaar, then you will lose the right to have rights. And that's again a very telling statement because the right to have rights comes from Hannah Arendt. Um, and, uh, and, and it comes from the idea that in any political community, you have citizens, and citizenship is marked by the fact that you are a person who has the right to access all those rights of equality, of, of free speech and so on. On the other hand, if you're not a citizen, then you, you lose even the right to access those, those, those basic rights. And that fundamental distinction uh, is what has been responsible for much of the oppression that we have seen over the last century. And so, technological self-determination tries to to bring that concept into play and, uh, and tries to set out a very abstract and basic idea about the link between constitutional values and principles on the one hand uh, and, uh, and tech on the other. So I'll, I'll close with that and, and I guess open it up for discussion and questions uh, and, and yeah, so, so it's so.